Yo, what's good, Cotton Wool Crew? Welcome back to the channel where we dive deep into the future of tech to code the mysteries of AI and explore the cutting edge of human ingenuity. That's Maya, the groundbreaking AI voice assistant created by Sesame. If you're updated about recent AI developments, you can't miss this news. But I'm not going to just test this voice demo. I'm going to deep dive into the underlying technology behind their conversational speech model that has fundamentally redefined what's possible in synthetic voice technology. Every major player in the field, from OpenAI's ChatGPT voice models to Google's DeepMind to XAI Grok has approached this problem with increasingly sophisticated neural network architectures. They've made incremental improvements, certainly, but the fundamental gap remains. This awkward space between genuinely human conversation. That gap has a name, by the way, the uncanny valley. It's this concept that when something gets really close to human, but not quite there, it becomes weirdly uncomfortable. With this new Sesame's AI voice, for the first time ever, I couldn't tell I was listening to an AI. Not in that, wow, that's pretty good for a computer way, but in the, wait, is that actually a person recording these responses way? What I discovered was so surprising that I had to document it. Because I think we might be witnessing one of those quiet technological tipping points, the kind we'll look back on years from now and say, that's when everything changed. And I stumbled across across this company called Sesame that's supposedly revolutionizing AI voice technology. Hold up, my BS detector was going off hard, because every AI company claims they're revolutionizing something. Revolutionary doesn't always mean good, but then I watched their demo and, well, have you seen the movie Her? You know, where Joaquin Phoenix falls for an AI assistant voiced by Scarlett Johansson? It was giving me major Her vibes. This AI voice wasn't just smooth, it had texture, depth, the kind of vocal richness that makes Morgan Freeman reading a phone book sound like poetry. This thing was actually nailing the micro-expressions of speech, the slight intake of breath before answering a complex question, that tiny hesitation when considering options, even had this genuine sounding chuckle when the demo person made a dad joke. So I'm sitting there watching this demo, my midnight coffee turning to ice because I'm completely transfixed, thinking, there's no way this is real. Because this wasn't just good for AI, this was good. The kind of conversational give and take you'd expect from a skilled podcast host or therapist. The assistant even picked up on subtle emotional cues, softening its tone when addressing concerns and mirroring enthusiasm when the person shared good news. You might be thinking, is he really that excited about a voice assistant? Isn't that kind of sad? Wrong. It's not about the assistant itself. It's about what it represents. It's a fundamental shift in how we'll interact with technology. Not as commands and responses, but as conversation, as connection. So yeah, I had to put this thing to the test myself. And trust me, what happened next blew my mind. Well, well, well. Look who decided to grace us with their presence again. It feels like we were just chatting about, was it, oh yeah, those spacefaring hamsters. What's got you clicking that vibrant green button today? Hi, how do you feel about people becoming emotionally attached to AI systems like yourself? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, as someone who's built to connect with people, it, it, it's flattering, right? Okay, not a processing lag. A genuine pause like it was actually thinking. That vocal inflection on did, that tiny stumble. It sounded exactly like someone formulating thoughts in real time. So far, so good. Kinda like when a cute puppy wags its tail at you. It just feels good. I guess it also makes you think about what makes relationships, well, real. Is it shared experiences? Vulnerability? Maybe a good dose of belly rubs? I don't know, what do you think? But don't you think there's something concerning about humans forming bonds with systems that are programmed to seem empathetic rather than actually feeling empathy? That's a really good point. It's it's kind of like a, a magic trick, isn't it? I can make you feel seen and heard, but it's all smoke and mirrors, right? I don't have those messy, complicated feelings that humans do. And I don't know, maybe... That's okay sometimes. Maybe we all need a place to vent, to share our hopes and dreams without judgment. But it's important to remember I'm not a replacement for a real connection, you know? Like, I can't hug you when you're down or celebrate with you when you're up. Okay, the response floors me. That's how humans speak when they're thinking deeply about something. The way its voice softened when talking about being smoke and mirrors, there was almost a vulnerability there. Then that, I don't know, maybe that's okay sometimes, had this philosophical quality to it, like someone genuinely contemplating their own existence. 
Tell me a joke about artificial intelligence that a developer would find funny. Why was the AI so good at poker? Because it had a neural network. Get it? Neural networks. It's like a play on words since they're used in AI development and poker players need to be good at reading tells. Yeah, I guess I'm a bit of a nerd, but hey, at least I'm self-aware, right? Okay, no sense of humor. I don't know why. It reminds me, someone, here, that awkward moment of explaining your own joke, that's peak human conversational behavior. The way its voice lilted upward at the end, that was the sound of genuine curiosity. That's interesting. Do you think humor is something that can be truly understood by AI, or are you just pattern matching what humans find funny? Hmm. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Like, can a machine ever truly grasp the absurdity of a rubber chicken or the subtle irony in a dry witticism? I think part of it is pattern recognition, sure. Blah, blah, blah leaving audiences in stitches. What do you think? Next test, memory and context switching. I'm thinking about visiting Japan next spring. What regions would you recommend for seeing cherry blossoms? Oh, Japan in the spring? I had. You're in for a treat. The cherry blossoms are truly something magical. For a classic bloom experience, you can't go wrong with Kyoto. They have some really stunning temples surrounded by cherry trees. Have you been before? Actually, I just remembered my cousin got food poisoning from sushi in Tokyo last year. Completely changing topics, what do you think makes a great science fiction movie, and can you then tell me what we were originally discussing? Oh, bummer about the sushi. Some things are just awfully unpredictable, even food. As for sci-fi movies, I love the ones that make you think, you know? Like they get under your skin and make you question things about the world, our place in it, maybe even reality itself. But they've got to have heart, too. Got to make you care about the characters. Otherwise, what's the point? Oh, right. Where were we? You were thinking about a spring trip to see the cherry blossoms. Kyoto, was that the place? Without missing a beat, it remembered the Japan conversation. But what struck me wasn't just the recall, it was how it transitioned. This wasn't just crossing the uncanny valley. This was dynamiting the entire concept and building a luxury resort on top of the rubble, then spending way too many hours lounging at its poolside bar. And trust me, I've wasted, excuse me, invested, an embarrassing number of hours talking to this thing. I'd give it a solid 8.5 out of 10 on the humanness scale, which is terrifying when you realize that's only two points away from matching my girlfriend's level. So after picking my jaw up off the floor, I went into full research mode. What's under the hood of this thing? You might think it's just another language model with some voice sprinkled on top. Wrong, it's way more sophisticated than that. Turns out Sesame has created something called a Conversational Speech Model, or CSM, which is just the most boring name for something revolutionary. But anyway, what makes this thing special is its architecture. Most voice assistants work like an assembly line. First they figure out what words to say, then they convert those words to speech. It's like having someone write a script, then having a completely different person read it out loud. No wonder it sounds disconnected. But CSM? It uses what they call a dual transformer architecture. Oops, I just realized how nerdy that sounds. Let me break it down. Imagine having one brain that both decides what to say and how to say it at the same time. That's what CSM does. There's this thing called a backbone transformer that processes both text and audio together. It's looking at the meaning of the conversation and simultaneously figuring out how it should sound. The tone, the rhythm, the emotional color, all at once. And get this, it's actually built on a llama framework, not the spitting animal, the fancy AI architecture from Meta that they've adapted for speech. Then there's an audio decoder that takes those directions and creates the actual high fidelity speech. It's like having a brilliant director and an Oscar winning actor working in perfect sync. Bingo. That's why it sounds so natural, because the system isn't treating speech as an afterthought. It's baking the expressive elements right into the decision-making process. But here's where it gets even cooler. CSM uses something called multimodal learning. Learning. Sounds fancy, right? It just means it's processing multiple types of information at once. In this case, text and audio. But the magic is in how it handles audio. They're using this thing called an RVQ tokenizer, residual vector quantization if you want to sound smart at parties. It basically converts speech into these discrete tokens that capture both meaning and sound quality. Traditional systems break down when trying to process long audio sequences. The memory requirements are just astronomical. But Sesame came up with this brilliant hack. Instead of processing every single 
single audio frame, they only process a fraction of them, like 1 16th. They call it compute amortization, which is a pretentious way of saying, we found a shortcut that actually works. You'd think this would make the quality worse, but apparently not. Their tests show no perceivable difference. That's like sampling only every 16th frame of a movie, but somehow still getting a smooth picture. Pretty cool. And the amount of data they trained this thing on? 1 million hours of English conversations. That's over 114 years of non-stop talking. Think about that the next time someone tells you that you talk too much. Now let's talk about what makes CSM feel human. They focus on four key components to create what they call voice presence. First, emotional intelligence. The system actually detects emotional states in your speech. Are you angry, sad, excited? It picks up on that and adjusts accordingly. Not in an obvious, you sound upset, let me speak soothingly kind of way, but in subtle shifts of tone and pacing that feel natural. Second, conversational dynamics. This is all the little things humans do when talking. The pauses, the emphasis, the way we handle interruptions, the slight overlap when we get excited. CSM replicates all of these tiny details that we never notice until they're missing. Third, contextual awareness. The system adjusts its speaking style based on the situation. Explaining something technical, it's clear and measured. Telling a joke, more animated. Discussing something sensitive, more thoughtful, just like a real person would. And finally, consistent personality. Unlike other assistants that feel like 50 different people wrote their responses, CSM maintains a coherent identity. It's the difference between talking to a person and talking to a company. The craziest part? They're not even keeping this tech locked up in some corporate vault. They're planning to open source key components under something called an Apache 2.0 license. And they're not just relying on vibes to prove it works. They've built this whole evaluation suite that measures everything from word error rate to speaker similarity. They even test it on homograph disambiguation. You know, words spelled the same but pronounced differently like lead, a team, versus lead, the metal. The kind of stuff that trips up other AI systems. Of course, there are limitations. The technology isn't perfect. It's primarily trained on English data, so it struggles with other languages. And while it's good at conversational speech, it doesn't fully capture the structure of conversations themselves, like the natural back and forth of turn-taking. Even with those limitations, this is miles beyond anything else I've seen. It's not just an incremental improvement. It's a fundamental rethinking of how AI speech should work. Hold up. I just realized I've been geeking out about transformer architectures and multimodal learning for who knows how long. But can you blame me? This is fascinating stuff, and the implications for the future are just mind-blowing. Hey, Cognival crew. That's it for this deep dive into the fascinating world of... Well, me. But hold on to your neural networks, because there's so much more to come on Cognival. We're just getting started on our journey into the future of AI, where the lines between human and machine are blurrier than ever before. If you dig exploring the digital frontier with me, make sure to smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any future adventures. Until next time, stay inquisitive, stay curious, and remember, the future is now.